name is Colette Mello. I'm a curator and the art programmer at FIU Miami Beach Urban Studios. Thank you for joining us today for a contemporary, a conversation with Miami-based artist Antonia Wright and independent curator Danielle Damas, presented by Miami Beach Urban Studios and Casa Cuba and the Frost Art Museum at FIU. Miami Beach Urban Studios is an incubator for communication, architecture, and the arts. We're excited to be collaborating on this series of art talks with Casa Cuba. This is our fifth talk in this series that highlights Cuban art and culture in Miami. Now I'm excited to introduce Danielle Damas, who will be in conversation with artist Antonia Wright. Danielle Damas is a Miami-based curator, cultural producer, creative consultant, and fine arts writer. She's a graduate of the MFA Curatorial Practice Program at Florida International University. She has curated numerous exhibitions throughout South Florida, including here at Miami Beach Urban Studios, the David Castillo Gallery, and the Bakehouse Art Complex. Her curatorial writings have been featured in the Miami Rail, in Specio, and Lux Interiors and Design Magazine. Hi, Danielle. It's great to see you. Thank you for inviting Antonia Wright to be part of this series. I look forward to your conversation this evening. Thank you, Colette, for your kind introduction. I'm so excited to present our fourth speaker of contemporary, Antonia Wright, who is a Cuban American artist born in 1979 in Miami, Florida. Wright received her MFA in poetry from the New School in New York City, as well as at the International Center of Photography for Photo and Video. She has exhibited in the US and abroad and has participated in artist residencies, both nationally and internationally. Exhibitions include shows at the Hishorn Museum and Sculpture Garden in Washington, DC, the Perez Art Museum Miami, and the Faina Art Center in Buenos Aires, just to name a few. In April 2012, she became the founder of the first artist in residence at the Lotus House Shelter in Overtown, Miami. She recently won a 2020 Ellie's Creator Award, the South Florida Cultural Consortium Award, and was a finalist for the Cintas Foundation Fellowship awarded to artists with Cuban heritage. She is represented by Spinello Projects in Miami, Florida, and affiliated with Luis de Jesus Gallery, Los Angeles. Wright's work has been presented in publications including the New York Times, Art Forum, Art in America, Hyperallergic, the Miami Herald, and the art newspaper, among others. Um, Antonia, thank you so much for joining us today, all the way here from Vermont. Hi, thank you so much for having me. <laughs> <laughs> um, we have a real treat tonight for everyone because Antonia is going to be showing us some images and visuals for some of her current projects and things that are upcoming for 2021. Um, but before we get started, I thought, you know, we we get a moment to start by, by getting to know you a little bit, uh, getting to know your background. I know I, I said a few things from your bio, but anything you want to share with the audience, um, just so they get to know you. <laughs> Sure. Um, yeah, as you mentioned, uh, my, my mother's Cuban. I was raised in Miami. Um, the work I'm going to be showing tonight is all about protests. And uh, my mother used to take me to protest um, all through my childhood. We used to go to Calle Ocho for Hermanos Arrecate, like, like, with the pots and pans. So, yeah, <laughs> like everything with the women in white. I remember the first time I saw them. I remember closing a bridge in Miami Beach uh, for a wet foot, dry foot policies. So, that sort of started, you know, kind of a love of protests, I would say. <laughs> From an early age. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I also wanted to mention to anyone who's tuned in, um, if you guys have any questions throughout the presentation, um, please feel free to enter them in um, or submit them through the chat. And I'm going to do my best to get through all of them uh, before we finish. But just so everyone's aware, just feel free to send whatever questions you feel like asking during this time and, and we'll be here for it. <laughs> so 
Antonia, um, did you, okay, so you, you grew up in Miami, correct? I did. Um, how did you make your way to Vermont? This is your second home or? <laughs> <laughs> That's an interesting question. Well, yeah, it's been an interesting year. Um, my mom bought a house in Vermont a few years ago and we normally come every summer. I have two little kids and they, it's good to see them like play in the woods and get dirty and run around in nature. And this year, I mean, we came up and then we never went back. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, it's day by day, so we'll see. But I have a feeling the cold will bring me home soon enough. And I have a big show coming up, so I have to be there for it. <laughs> yes, that show's coming up in November? Or... Um, well, a few shows, but there's a big, big one in January. That's okay. a public art installation that I'm working on. So I 100% have to be there. And if I go to Miami in December, it's so beautiful. And I have a feeling that I'll stay. And coming back to January in Vermont isn't going to be as as alluring. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so true. Well, speaking of projects, um, I guess we can get started on the presentation. Um, and I think you're going to share your screen. So just give us a moment, everyone. Sure. So. Um, I will talk about a few projects. Um, this is a project that I currently have up and this is in the design district. It's in a storefront window there. Um, it's a project created by Claire Bucal and they offered me, um, yeah, the storefront. Um, and so, you know, I've been like everybody else in my house watching the news um, and watching our country erupt into protest over um, systemic racism and police brutality. And um, I found that like the media focuses so much on this idea of riots and these images that you see over and over again. Uh, and I really wanted to make something as a response to that. I think that the images or this conversation around riots is a way to deflect and to ignore the root causes, which are causing the actual peaceful protests and a way to really kind of criminalize um, the conversation around these, these, this looting. So this is started as a photo process. Maybe I'll start by talking a little bit about um, the process. So these are individual photos. Um, they're cyanotypes. So how I make this is I converted my uh, my attic in Vermont, which we have here, into a dark room. And I mix this chemistry and I paint it on this paper. And then I go outside and I lay a sheet of glass over the paper. And then with a hammer, I smash the glass. And I leave the glass over the page and then the exposure happens in the sun. Um, and then afterward, I remove the glass and then I rinse off the chemistry and then you have a archival image that remains. And so they're very much sort of embodying uh, the aesthetics of protests is sort of what I've been looking at a lot um, when I've been researching protests for the last few years. Um, and then from these images, I take them all and I scan them all and I made long composite images exactly the size of each of these windows. And then they're uh, printed on vinyl and it adhered on the inside of these windows. So it looks like, like they're broken. If you were just walking down the street, you might think that they're broken, but because of the color blue, I think they're so like um, seductive and it presents these kind of images that we've been seeing so much in the news, but in this really like undeniably gorgeous way because of the color. And it also takes something that's like a concrete image, like broken glass and abstracts it. So I find that it looks like nerves in the body, you know, or veins or stained glass even, which is really beautiful. And then I'm presenting it also with uh, a video that I made a few years ago, but still I find relevant to this project. And we play. Um, because in this project, it's myself. And this is what a lot of my work has been like for the last like 10 years or so. It's using my own body in usually very physical ways. So in this project, I'm thrown against sheets of glass over and over again until I break the glass. And um, this is and real glass. Excuse me? This is real glass. It's not like the-, the Yeah, this is a, yeah, a type of glass. <laughs> and so I like this in the context of the windows because it talks about breaking in an empowering way. So mm -hmm. you're kind of breaking in order to break through. Like if you think about it in terms of transformation. 
um, you have to have a breakthrough, you know, to get to the other side, you know, and breakthrough or transformation is uncomfortable, like breaking the glass is uncomfortable. But I think that's what happens to, you know, hopefully not go back to the status quo, but to break through and kind of reflect the fact that our system is so broken that you end up with riots. Like, I think riots are very indicative, you know, of that when you think about analyzing protests and the aesthetics of protests. Also the word looting, oh, just this is a Hindi word. I was researching it and it's very much from like colonial times. Um, but it's interesting because they never talk about like museums having loot, you know, like can all the artifacts from other countries that are in museums, but yet they're very quick to throw up this word loot when it comes to protests. And really as a way to kind of like not talk about um, the issues that are, that are causing riots to begin with. Right. And then as for the, the photographs, um, I know that you scan, transfer them into vinyls. Are the original photographs, um, you know, somehow um, used separately in, in the presentation? Are they, are they in your house in Vermont? Are they? <laughs> Where are they now? Well, actually, yeah, they're still in my house, but um, I did win the consortium this year. And as a new part of the consortium, they are acquiring works from all the winners to be in the art and public um, collection. So actually six of the photographs that were used in that installation are now going to art and public. So they might end up in like the airport or the library. <laughs> um, yeah, thank you, thank you. But yeah, I thought that if I just hung the actual artworks in the windows, people would just see it and be like, oh, it's artwork in a window and kind of like dismiss it. But this way it's like a real intervention that's using the medium of the window, you know, mm -hmm. the vinyl. And I think that kind of complicates the conversation in a productive way. Right. Thinking back to what you were mentioning about break, the only way to break, um, to get through something or in moments of transition or, or transformation is to break through things. Um, would you, I think you had mentioned when we were, you know, planning the presentation that this was kind of like a feminine take on, on that. Do you want to exp uh, explain that a little more? Yeah, well, I mean, in presenting that work, you know, with the idea, like that other project uh, has a few meanings, but one of them is like definitely a way of showing like breaking the glass ceiling, mm -hmm. you know, in a way. And I think that the glass and that act, you know, there's um, the, the glass has a vulnerability in it, the same way that the female body always does. But then it shows like um, the action of me breaking the glass shows like just because women aren't as strong as men doesn't mean we're not as strong as men. You know, so it's like a very powerful action um, and portrayed in a productive way, you know, in a powerful, empowering way. Right. Tons of force. <laughs> Tons of force. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, um, and then thinking back, um, just just to to the the word looting, like you mentioned, how it has these colonial tethers to it. Um, did you? Um, is language is a large part of this work as well? Mm -hmm. So, yeah. um, you said it was from a Hindi origin. Yes, the word loot is originally a Hindi word. Okay. Yeah, and that there was like an uprising in India against English colonial rule, and then they blamed the the protesters and called them looters. And it was, and then they took those images of um, Indian people protesting as a way to kind of criminalize them for the rest of colonial rule in India. So it's the same thing kind of happening now. It's like kind of it's like othering uh, and blaming you know, for what's happening. Um, but yet the, the language is always important in my work. You know, I always kind of think about that because I do have a background in poetry and the title of the piece is called Map, mm -hmm. which I think kind of charts the past and kind of shows where we were, but then it's also still thinking about like the future and like what remains and where are we going now. And how, how long is that piece going to be up in a design district? Was it also <laughs> intentional to have it there? Um, yeah, only one more week. Oh. Keep it up. Yeah, <laughs> I just got the news. Um, so, so yeah, the space was rented. So that's sort of part of this project is there, like these little spaces that are available and then they're putting artworks in. So when I saw the storefront, I was like, well, I have to make something about 
the storefront in America in 2020, you know, I'm like yeah. <laughs> such a loaded place. Um, yeah, so it's up for one more week and you can see it from the street or your car and it's not by appointment, it's just there always and the video is always running, so. Please. So everybody has one more week. <laughs> yeah, check it out. And there's amazing projects right now in the design district. There's one by Adler, Guerreri, um, with Four Freedoms and Christina Le Rodriguez. And like, there's a whole bunch of other really cool shows. Mm -hmm. And then um, the next project you wanted to talk about, um, I'll let you. <laughs> I'll okay, let you. I'm like, which is it? <laughs> uh, <laughs> um i think i will talk about this one um that's coming up so as a part of the consortium um we have an exhibition at the fort lauderdale museum of art uh curated by bonnie clearwater and so it's part of you know my research on protests i started researching a lot about hong kong protests and the pro-democracy movement and it there's such a fascinating protest because it's all about like being ahead of the technology that's getting used against them in protest so mm -hmm. um their motto is be water from a, a bruce lee movie which means like always adapting always changing their tactics and one big tactic is that they don't they're trying to block facial recognition technology. So they're using a lot of lasers in protests. And what they do is they shine lasers on the cameras so that they can mobilize and move and organize and not have their um, their identity taken and sent to mainland China where they, where they will be surveilled for basically the rest of their lives. So they're using these lasers a lot. And it's interesting, this, I guess I should move backward, but the, um, they had these lasers and a lot of them are like, $10, $12 cat lasers that you can buy on Amazon, but yet they're using them in this really effective way. And so then they arrested one day, this one protester for having 10 lasers in his backpack. And they did this whole scene, uh, a press uh, conference with the police where they held up a piece of newspaper and they had a police officer shine a laser until it started smoking. And so then the next day, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people showed up with lasers as like an anti-protest movement against this one protester getting arrested. And I saw this image and I was like, is this a concert? Like, what is this? It's like, it looks like a laser light show. And I was like, is this what protest is going to look like in the future? Wow. Like, it's so unbelievably gorgeous. But then it's also really like eerie when you think about like what these what it means and what's behind these lasers. So um, here they're using them against the police. And then here's this one person held up a newspaper and everybody shined the light on it to show. Cause like, if you can arrest somebody for that idea of putting a hole through a newspaper, you can arrest somebody for like a pencil, you know, or anything, you know, like anything can be deemed offensive. So it becomes very much like arbitrary policing, um, which we see. So this was like this kind of action. So then um, this is in Chile and Santiago. They were using lasers a lot as well when the country erupted there in protest earlier in the year. So you're starting to see them now and look how like it's unbelievably beautiful. So I'm making an installation now um, using these lasers. Um, and then there's an audio score as well um, that's gonna be, and that opens uh, November 21st at okay. NSU Museum of Art, Fort Lauderdale. So for your piece at NSU, is it going to be a performance? Is there a performance component or is it uh, just installation? It is an installation, um, but it's very much performative. I found this poem um, by this American, famous American poet, Anne Sexton. Mm -hmm. And um, she used to read a poem about her daughter at Vietnam protests. And that was sort of her like political action, um, her protest action, which I thought was kind of so amazing. Like this idea of reading a poem about your daughter and her growing body and kind of like living as an act of protest or, you know, they say like joy is an act of protest or joy is an act of resistance, you know? And um, so it's her, which back then is sort of like her idea of an action in protest sort of like this is an action in protest in the 21st century, you know? So it's, um this audio score that I've mixed with a beat of her reading this poem and then to these lights, so it's all synced. So when you walk in there, it'll be like moving around the space so you can come and see it. 
testimony. Yeah. yeah. These images are really powerful. Just even like they're beautiful. They, they, they look like a concert. And like you're saying, they, they, it, it's once you realize what's actually happening, it's, it's eerie, but you also see this energy, like this, this, this density in, in the people and seeing all the light. I mean, it's, it's really amazing. I have a question here from one of our viewers. Um, they want to know, where do you find inspiration for your pieces? Has the source of inspiration changed over time? Oh, well, actually it hasn't. I always find inspiration from the news. I think that all my work is always based on like mediated images that I see and then kind of transforming them and bringing it to the body as a way to understand. And like for before this kind of work, um, for the last 10 years, I've been making my work up using my own body so like I would read the news and then I found myself feeling like really apathetic like not intentionally but I would read the news like every day and then it was like very hard to connect to like or deeply care about what I was reading over and over again um so then I would kind of bring it all to my body as a way to understand um like I've done things like rolled naked down alleys in Miami Beach, like when the BP oil spill happened, I felt so disgusting that I wanted to do something to my body that equaled what we were doing to nature. So it was always like this way of bringing it in or understanding. And I think it still carries through to like these projects, like the broken glass, like we see it over and over again in the news or even these lasers, like kind of like bringing it in as a way to kind of like connect with it on a visceral level. So even though I'm not using my own body these days, I'm trying to create situations for the audience to sort of feel, you know, what, what it is you would be reading about or seeing. Wow. I mean, that must also, do you, have you ever felt very surprised? Like, let's say after one of these, um, you know, you watch the news, you, the BP oil spill, you roll your body down, um, you know, a, a street, have you ever been surprised by what you feel afterward? Every time. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> totally. Because I have like an idea in my head mm -hmm. and I'll go through all the components of it, but I won't do it intentionally until the performance, either for a live audience or for video, mm -hmm. because I want this kind of like raw energy and this immediacy to the action and if i know what's going to happen then it's more of like i'm acting and it's less performance art mm -hmm. and i love performance art i really really do and I, what i love about it is that like kind of raw immediacy of it and so like you're always making decisions in the moment i think that's a really big part of it so even though i have some of this stuff planned like i have no idea what's going to happen until i'm sort of there so I'm always sort of surprised afterward. Like even like rolling down the alley, like I got a, I hit my head really hard. I got a concussion. I got a black <laughs> eye. Um, but yeah, it's all sort of. I think hopefully it was into like the the work. Right. <laughs> so we have one more. Well, we have two more projects to talk about. Correct. Yes. Okay. Um, so I'll talk about a project. Um, Maybe I'll talk about this one and then um so I just won um an Ellie award out of Ulite Arts um for this sculpture uh and this is just some text it says it's in collaboration with this musician Elado Negro um and what I've done is transformed a cement truck into a music instrument that protests anti-immigrant nationalism by transforming the cement truck into an instrument that plays this song, Young, Latin, and Proud. Yeah, so the cement truck, this is an animation showing how it will work. And it looks like a music box. And I thought about using it or converting it into a music box instrument, but then I realized that it has more Western European origins. So then this is now based off of Madimba, which is originally from Africa, but then taken to the Caribbean. Um, and so that's it. I think it ties more into the concept. So it thinks about like... Um, oh. so you, there was a little bit of a, a sound <laughs> competition. Do you mind repeating about... Oh, sure. um, the origin of the instrument? 
Yes. So it's uh, originally an African instrument that was taken to Latin America, to the Caribbean mm -hmm. and South um, Latin America and brought in. Yeah. And it thinks about like, what, what is the material of protest? Like what is holding up these bodies in public space? And it's like concrete, you know? And then you think about like, but who's building those sidewalks? You know, the same people who are trying to get kicked off of them or who's building the wall, the same people who are dying trying to cross the wall. So the cement truck really talks about like all the invisible labor and trying to bring in, but then with the song, Young, Latin and Proud, it's really like this positive song that is sort of like a call to protest, like to bring the Latinx or the brown body into the public sphere of protests. Mm -hmm. So I'm working on this now. So speaking of invisible labor, um, when you think of this, this project, how do you how do you envision it unfolding? Like, do you feel like this truck would be mobile? Like, or it is mobile? Yeah. yeah, I think that's one of the cool things about this. I mean, the scale is enormous. Like, it, it's hard to go inside a space, but it could go outside, and it can definitely travel. So, I think of it as going to protests. You know. Um, or going to the wall, you know, going, mm -hmm. it can travel. And I think the context of where it is shown will affect its meaning too. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, maybe working with Elado Negro on singing live or performing with it. <laughs> that could be really cool. I'm just, I like just looking at it, I think of, I wonder how loud it would be. I wonder what kind of materials you'd use to, to make the, the little marks on the, on the truck, you know? Yeah. I, that's where I go. <laughs> Well, that's where, I mean, we're working on it now. Like we've done these kind of renders on how, you know, it would kind of work now. And then the next step would be to make a prototype uh, at half scale or a quarter scale and kind of work through the mechanics of it. Wow. And then to make the full thing. So if anybody knows of any access to cement trucks or companies that would want to sponsor or partner with me on this. Please put it in the chat. <laughs> I'd love to talk with you. We have another question here. Um, what has been the most surprising, fulfilling reaction you've seen from people viewing your art and social performances? Hmm. Um, what has been the most surprising thing? Or fulfilling. Or fulfilling. I guess like the conversations that happen from each work or around the works, you know, that's sort of where, where it's nice. Or like, actually, I've seen people crying looking at some of my work. And I think that's the goal of all my projects is sort of like empathy. Like we were talking about, like, um, where's the source material or what's the inspiration? And like, always for me, it's like to empathize, you know, with what's happening and and so then I sort of try to present in a way for the audience to kind of empathize as well. Um, so when you see somebody crying, looking at one of your artworks, it's kind of really, really powerful. Like it really affected them. Or when people were like, I want my kids to see this, kind of really love that. You know, like, like this idea of wanting to share it in like a positive way is, is kind of great. Um, but nothing really radical. I mean, like no one's ever taken their clothes off or I don't know, done anything like funny, you know, <laughs> like too nuts. Um, yeah. <laughs> I think that's one of the best things about, um, you know, being in the arts or being creative. It's being able to, to present these ideas to people that like can, can empathize that, that people are able to empathize with or, or, feel validated or, or feel seen. So some of these projects, it's like the second you say like, oh, young Latin and, and free, it's like, oh man, I know that song. And um, it's, it's this excitement of representation, this excitement of, um, you know, something that's moving, something that's going to, to help bring awareness, help bring, you know, collectivity and, and just connection. And it's, it's all exciting. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, I have another question here. What do your kids think of your art? Have you been, have they been inspired to create their own art? Yes. Um, yeah, I make videos with my son and then um, he loves it. He thinks it's great. I mean, he really likes the kinetic sculptures. 
those are like like the cement truck i think i probably made it for him in a way because he's like so obsessed with all kinds of machinery um they think it's great um and my mom now is really happy i'm not using my own body in all my work it's like a flip side she hated really much like the all the physical um work but um yeah they love it they love everything about it my kingdom <laughs> I can imagine that's exciting. <laughs> so we uh, have one more, well, yeah, we have one more project to talk about and that is um, oh, yeah. the barricades, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So this one, I'm, I was thinking about starting like with the source material, um, the, well, um, like, a little bit of my research. So I've been researching barricades in protest, um, maybe for like, yeah, the last five years and just looking at these objects. I mean, they've really sort of infiltrated our landscape without much questioning um, and they're ubiquitous, they're everywhere. And you do see them a lot in protest. People see them a lot or they think of them a lot like, oh, concerts, you know, but they have really like, they're, I've read a lot of police manuals talking about how to use barricades, and how to con like control protests. And this was actually the first image that I saw that really got me thinking about this. They, um, they were putting these out in response to the Freddie Gray verdict. And like, they knew they were gonna be protests. And now that I think about it, there will be probably, they knew there were gonna be protests on both sides, whether these police officers were indicted or not. So mm -hmm. like, and they're not very heavy like see like they're just very much like this illusion of control or order but i find they almost like incite violence when they're used you know and they're on both sides like this is the removal of those robert e lee sculptures like they're on the on the on like this side and the other side so it's very much like a dividing line and these are occupy wall street they were there as well um i mean these the ones that i'm showing you now are very much like in the u.s there's a long history of barricades in other countries um like an insurgent barricade like a people's barricade like in france you know like to the barricades you know like the people blocking off the streets um but here these are oh yeah these are amazing um these are like covered in these tiffany blue because they're next to Trump Tower when he first got elected. Um, so it's like like beautifying these barricades. Um, giving them clothes. There another, what's that? <laughs> giving them clothes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like hiding them, you know, like fancing on them. And these are another type of barricades or trucks. You know, there's like large, there's like terrorist barricades. This is the Women's March, you know. Um, so then there's a lot. So then there's um, the with me so we were invited this is in collaboration with another artist who i work with a lot uh ruben diaris and we are uh have been asked to make a piece for this project called illuminate coral gables which will be a one month light exhibition in coral gables in january so they've commissioned artists to make light works and to display it all around coral gables so it's on the streets so when they were telling me about this i was like well what's an object of the street you know like the barricade and the the exhibition will be using barricades so i was like why don't we light them these objects that are really designed to become invisible let's light them to really highlight them and talk about them and make them very visible to kind of show how their presence is on our street so these are um oh there we go um these are barricades this is a rendering for kind of what it will look like oh, excuse me let's see um and then these are, I oh know you could see, it wasn't letting me flip for some reason. These are prototypes for, for taking the barricades and lighting them. So you'll see like how they glow and how you can see them on the street. So yeah, that's like gonna be in January. And it's a really amazing show because again, it's all on the streets, all social distance. You can kind of drive or walk around and see it. So it's thinking about a new way to present work under these circumstances. And uh, I believe you had told me this, but I'm not sure now. <laughs> are they going to be um, intentionally obstructing traffic or are they going to be sectioned off in like a pedestrian area? They're gonna be 
both. So there'll be clusters of them all around the area of the exhibition. So yeah, sometimes they're gonna block, sometimes they'll be in front of another artwork. So they'll be used in different ways. Mm -hmm. Just to make it more pronounced, more visible. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, like lighting the ones that they would have already maybe normally used and then kind of placing them in other areas for mm -hmm. for to kind of highlight them. Amazing. And you're doing that in a collaboration? Yes. Yeah, yeah with another artist, with Ruben uh, Miades, is an artist I've worked with for different projects off and on throughout the years. Amazing. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's exciting. It's fun. That's super, super exciting, um, especially for Coral Gables. Um, I guess um, one question I would have with with those um, you you particularly are using just those types of barricades, not necessarily not necessarily the cement ones, which I also find are creeping in on <laughs> the the like the environment, like I remember going down Lincoln Road and it was very open going and crossing the street and now there's these cement barricades on each yep. crossing. So, which is interesting, it's interesting the concept of protection versus, you know, <laughs> obstruction and, and things like that. But yeah. you're, you're focused on the metal lightweight ones. Yeah, the more the police use barricades or those metal barricades. Yeah, because those are the ones that the other ones that you're talking about are terrorist barricades. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, those are you see them now everywhere. And you'll see them too. Like if you ever see like downtown Miami, I think it's in front of the courthouse. They have like these huge like planters. Those are kind of types of terrorist barricades. Mm -hmm. um, like even in that picture of Trump Tower, like the, um, the Tiffany the trucks, like that's a type, you know? Um, so there's all these different ways, but I just kind of think it's interesting in the context of protests, like how public is public space, like when you're being organized and controlled within it, you know? Um, so just to kind of, just to even talk about these objects and kind of maybe make you notice them now. I mean, I see them everywhere. Like, yeah. you know, they were like totally ubiquitous and they've totally like entered into our landscape over the years, you know, um, so. Yeah, they've creeped in. Yeah. I have a question here. How important are collaborations for artists today? How can younger artists connect with more experienced artists and maybe find a collaboration there? Yeah. Um, well, I love collaborating with other artists because, you know, I have a way of doing things or thinking about how to execute a project. But then if you work with somebody else, like Ruben is, you know, he's an amazing musician. So sometimes when I work with him, all of a sudden he's focusing on the sound, or the you know, a lot. And like, that's something that I would think about later down the line, but it's not the first thing I think about, you know? Um, so it's really cool because then you kind of bring your skill sets together and make something bigger, you know, or my dynamic or a little bit different than how you would normally create or think. Uh, younger artists, I mean, I would start, I mean, if you, you could always ask like artists if you can work in their studios. It's a really interesting way to learn about another artist process uh, or mentorship. Um, yeah, I think also like collaborations, I don't know if they never, I've never found them to be so planned. Like they just sort of start happening based around your conversations or the people you know, you know, your connections. Maybe younger artists could start collaborating with their teachers. Um, so yeah, I think there's like no manual on how to do anything ever in the art, especially in the arts. So we kind of just like, just start, start making. And I find once you just start focusing on making work, everything starts unfolding. Mm -hmm. You kind of attract it's it's exactly what you're saying it's not necessarily planned but it kind of just you know happens where you realize oh I have this common interest hey I, I know how I can help you there and then you know it just kind of the magic happens together um but yeah definitely reaching out to teachers or you know seeing if you can have some sort of mentorship is something that's always worked for me at least mm -hmm. <laughs> um can you um, talk a little bit about the importance of networking for students in the art field? I guess it's, it goes hand in hand with that previous question. Um, 
Yeah, I think it's like when you're in school, like one of the great things about being in school is your network and all your peers and all your teachers and everyone you're exposed to. And I think that, you know, in the art world for whatever, it's so, seems so big, but it's, I don't think it really is. And like, I think everybody ends up coming back in your life all the time, at least I find, you know? So like really kind of gravitate toward the people that, yeah, that you have like a connection with and you find exciting um, and just start building from there, creating too. You know, you can also like, if you wanted to, um, one way, I guess, to the previous question, like wanted to work with older artists in collaboration necessarily, like um, you could start a collective and invite artists to join. Like I work with this international collective. We're based all around the world, all different ages, demographics, like everything, nationalities. So, um, and we keep bringing in people based on each project or each country we work in. So that's kind of a cool way that's not so fixed, you know, it doesn't have to be so rigid, I guess, but it's just like this kind of like, we inspire each other and then um, and work and keep working and then it kind of unfolds. So, I mean, you know, like I think in the art world also like network sounds like a really formal word, but I think it's just like your friends and like people that, that you respect. Yeah, people you respect that you think of them in your mind and, and it's just positive positive energy and positive thoughts and it kind of all leads into positive change so <laughs> yeah. um can and you it just like unfolds oh like now I have a group of like 10 people I work with maybe I'm formally on like each project I mean they're all my friends but they all have like something specific that they're really all good at mm -hmm. um and then uh, it's like sort of my goal is just to work with people I really like and respect in places that I like and respect the people I like and respect. So, you know. That's that's a big thing you just mentioned too about having everybody good at something specific. It's really important, at least personally, to realize like what I'm really not great at. I should not pretend I'm great at it. And, <laughs> and if someone, you know, in my circle is, the the master of that thing it's kind of this blessing that's that's brought to you because you guys fit you're yin and yang you're you're able to collaborate and bring something to the table that you know the other person needs needs a little help on or or you know is just missing that little piece and it's really beautiful to see it all come together yeah it's so true like I think at the beginning when you think you're an artist you have to do everything mm -hmm. but you don't have to learn how to do everything like, cause right now there's already somebody who's like been doing it their whole lives and they're a master. So like work with them on a project, you know, like bring them in. So I realized that a while ago, like I'm never going to be a welder, like a master welder, like to the scale that some people, like my friend who helps me on all my projects work is. So I just bring them in and we work together on the project, you know, and that's, and that's great. You know, I don't have to learn how to be a master builder <laughs> to still like be able to kind of execute all the ideas. Right. What is the lesson you learned or advice um, as you transition from art student to an independent artist? <laughs> What's the lesson you learned from art student to independent artist? Well, I think it's all evolving. Um, like in there's a couple things I mean like early in my career somebody told me like being an artist was like running a small business so like even if that sounds really boring and it probably is it is like I have spreadsheets you know I pay my taxes <laughs> like I run my studio like a business um and that's something you learn how to kind of develop as you go you know like your powerpoint skills <laughs> like things that you never think you need but then um I mean I guess the biggest difference is that you know like you don't have critiques every week so then you have to sort of start learning to cultivate a group of people whose kind of feedback you want because it sometimes isn't so helpful just to get so much feedback when you're in the midst of working on a project because it could maybe stall your momentum with the project so just kind of like creating that kind of environment for yourself outside of the outside of the classroom but i guess it goes back to the network like keep your relationships with all the teachers that you find really close with now and you could still go to them ask for them for advice in the future 
Yeah, that's true. Your teachers, at least they're supposed to be, <laughs> they're supposed to be there, you know, as a resource for a very long time. And like you said, the art world is actually very small. So I feel like you always come back to, to people over time. And yeah, great point also about having that kind of chosen circle to, to workshop ideas with, because I mean, I know I have some people in my life that you know, aren't necessarily in the creative field. So to ask a creative question, sometimes it works out, but most of the time it's, it's you know, you wanna keep those people that are gonna keep you accountable, but are also, you know, in that same kind of arena as you, which is pursuing the same, you know, kind of creative output and, and positivity. So um, I do have, okay, so I have one more question. Can you talk a little about the role spaces play in your art? Um, I'm thinking of using smaller, large spaces. So the audience experience feelings. Hmm. I guess, yeah, if space plays a part in like how someone can interpret your artwork or feel a certain way or have a verse uh, visceral response. Well, specifically to that question, I mean, the artist I think of when she's talking is like Mika Rottenberg. I don't know if, if this person, know, like if you know them, she's a video artist and um, she shows videos, but like she's always shown them in like, she'll build these small cubes. So you go into them and it's always overcrowded and then she makes these like internal worlds that develop Mika Rottenberg and like watching the video in these like claustrophobic cubes, I feel like really adds to what she's trying to accomplish. So I think that's one way like kind of creating, she creates that even if it's not site specific, like she'll make it site specific in that way, you know? Um, so that may be a good example for creating emotions, but yeah, I think that's always about like responding to the site, making it site specific. I mean, I'm always thinking about the body. So I think about how the audience moves through the space. Like if I project a video, I usually want my body to scale. So there's sort of like a mirror reaction that happens with the viewer. So there's different things I think that you can use to highlight that. That's super nice. So do we have any other questions tonight? If not, I think we may be, um, um, closing up the program. I'm just gonna wait 10 seconds <laughs> just in case any, any, okay. <laughs> well, thanks everyone for, for joining in tonight. I, I really love this presentation and thank you so much Antonia for, for providing all of, you know, this wonderful, insight into your practice into what you have coming up I know I'm super excited to see all this stuff coming to the city and you know even neighbor cities Fort Lauderdale so thank you so much if everyone can can um, kind of unmute and and say hello or have like a little greeting maybe say goodbye <laughs> um, I, I invite anybody to to just give a wave or a, a nice little message to Antonia for joining us tonight. Hi, Neil. <laughs> nice Hi, to Dan. see you. Thank you very much. That was wonderful. Super. Good to see you too. It's been such a long time. <laughs> Thank you. Well, hi. Hi, Julian. Nice to see you. <laughs> I know. Amazing projects. Thank like, you. Made by like all the concept on the concrete uh, truck. It's just like, it blew my mind. It's like, yes. yes. And so makes so much sense. Uh, like the way you just think about who did this and that and that and just coming back to like the roots of like, who is making these roads? Like the workers who also like, no one seen like that type of like labor. So like, I, I was amazed by that. And, Thank you very much for, for showing that to us. And it's an inspiration and looking forward to see them. <laughs> wow, thank you. It's so nice of you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Antonia, for sharing your time. Oh, Danielle, thank you so much. This has been so <laughs> wonderful. Really, so nice to get to meet you and talk with you. Thank you, Casa Cuba. Thank you, everyone, for watching, really, and supporting the work. Yeah.
really grateful. Thank you. It was yes. really wonderful. And please join us next for our next uh, contemporary conversation um, with Juana Valdez, which will be November 17th at 5.30 p.m. Um, it's going to be great. <laughs> um, hopefully just as great as tonight. And thank you again. Thank you again, Antonia. Thank you again to the audience. You guys had great questions. So I'm, I'm really glad um, all of you showed up and tuned in and, and had all these wonderful things to say.